December 15, 1971. Stanford University's Psychology Department. Dr. Gordon Gallup places a red mark on an anesthetized chimpanzee's forehead, then positions the animal in front of a mirror. What happens next will fundamentally challenge everything we think we know about consciousness, identity, and the nature of self-awareness. The chimp awakens, approaches the mirror, stares. Then, in a moment that sends ripples through decades of scientific thought, reaches up and touches the mark on its own face. Not the reflection, but the actual mark. The chimp has recognized itself. It knows that the image in the mirror is not another creature, but itself. You might think this is a simple observation, but consider what has actually occurred. This chimpanzee has demonstrated something that most animals never achieve, the recognition that there exists an I separate from everything else in the universe, a boundary between self and other, an inner observer watching from behind the eyes. But here's where the story takes a disturbing turn. What if that recognition, that fundamental sense of I am, is itself an illusion? You wake up every morning with the unwavering certainty that you are you, the same person who went to sleep the night before, the continuous thread of memory and experience that stretches back through your entire life feels solid, unquestionable. Your thoughts arise in your head. Your decisions emerge from your will. Your consciousness flows like an unbroken river from past to future. This feeling is so convincing that questioning it seems absurd. Yet neuroscience has been quietly dismantling this illusion piece by piece. Dr. Michael Gazaniga's split-brain experiments in the 1960s revealed something unsettling. When the connection between the brain's two hemispheres was severed, patients would sometimes find their left hand acting independently, buttoning a shirt while the right hand tried to unbutton it, or reaching for objects the conscious mind had no intention of grasping. Two separate centers of awareness seem to coexist in the same skull, which raises a chilling question. How many yous are there inside your head right now? The ancient Hindu concept of the Atman suggested that consciousness is not produced by the brain, but rather exists as a fundamental aspect of reality itself pure awareness temporarily identifying with the illusion of individual selfhood. Modern neuroscience has arrived at a strikingly similar conclusion through a completely different path. Your brain processes roughly 11 million bits of information per second. Your conscious mind is aware of approximately 40. The vast majority of your mental activity happens in darkness beneath the threshold of awareness. Decisions begin forming in your neural circuits up to 10 seconds before you become consciously aware of making them. The feeling of willing an action often comes after the action has already been initiated at the neural level. So who exactly is making your choices? Dr. Elizabeth Loftus's groundbreaking research on false memories revealed something that challenges the very foundation of personal identity. In her experiments, she could implant detailed memories of events that never happened. Participants would remember being lost in a shopping mall as a child, complete with emotional details and sensory experiences. These memories felt absolutely real, indistinguishable from genuine recollections. If your memories can be altered, fabricated, or distorted without your knowledge, what does that mean for your sense of continuous self? Consider this. Every night when you sleep, your consciousness disappears entirely. You experience nothing. You are, for all practical purposes, gone. Then you wake up, and somehow you're convinced you're the same person who went to sleep hours earlier. But what connects morning you to evening you except memories that neuroscience tells us are unreliable? changeable and constantly being reconstructed. The Buddhist concept of anatta, 
The doctrine of no self suggests that what we call the self is merely a collection of ever-changing mental and physical processes. Like a river that appears continuous, but is actually composed of entirely different water from moment to moment. Modern cognitive science has reached a remarkably similar conclusion. The self is not a thing, but a process. Not a noun, but a verb. Your identity is being continuously authored by neural systems you're not conscious of, using memories that may not be accurate, to create a story of continuity that may not reflect reality. In quantum mechanics, the act of observation fundamentally alters reality. A particle exists in multiple states simultaneously until consciousness collapses the wave function into a single outcome. The observer and the observed are inextricably linked in ways that challenge our basic assumptions about objective reality. But here's what makes this deeply unsettling. If consciousness can alter physical reality at the quantum level, what does that mean for the reality you experience every day? Your brain doesn't passively receive information about the world. It actively constructs your reality moment by moment, filling in blind spots, interpreting ambiguous sensory data, and creating a seamless experience of consciousness from fragmented neural activity. The colors you see don't exist in the external world. They're interpretations your brain creates from electromagnetic wavelengths. The solid objects you touch are mostly empty space, held together by forces you can't perceive. The ancient Taoist sage Zhuangzi famously asked, How do I know that loving life is not a delusion? How do I know that in hating death I am not like a man who, having left home in his youth, has forgotten the way back? His question cuts to the heart of something profound. If your perceptions, memories, and thoughts are all constructions, what can you actually know about reality? Neuroscientist Anil Seth describes consciousness as a controlled hallucination, your brain's best guess about what's happening based on limited and often unreliable information. You're not experiencing the world as it is. You're experiencing your brain's interpretation of electrical and chemical signals. You are living inside a story your brain tells itself about itself. Dr. Julian Jaynes proposed one of the most radical theories in psychology, that human consciousness as we know it is a recent development, emerging only around 3,000 years ago. Before this, he argued, humans experienced a bicameral mind, hearing the voices of gods and ancestors as auditory hallucinations that guided their behavior. While Jaynes's specific timeline is controversial, his deeper insight remains haunting. What we call consciousness may not be the fundamental state of mind, but a particular kind of mental phenomenon that arose under specific conditions. The meditation traditions of Buddhism and Hinduism have long taught that ordinary consciousness is like a dream from which it's possible to awaken. They describe states of awareness in which the sense of being a separate self dissolves entirely, revealing a more fundamental consciousness that exists prior to thought, memory, and identity. Neuroscientist Sam Harris drawing from both contemplative traditions and modern brain science, suggests that the feeling of being a self located behind the eyes is itself a kind of optical illusion of consciousness. When advanced meditators report the dissolution of the self, they may not be entering an altered state. They may be recognizing what was always true. Recent neuroimaging studies of experienced meditators show decreased activity in the default mode network the brain regions associated with self-referential thinking and the sense of being a continuous self. It's as if the very neural basis of selfhood can be temporarily switched off, revealing something more fundamental underneath. But if you're not the voice in your head, not your memories, not your thoughts, not your emotions, not your body, then what are you? 
The Sufi poet Rumi wrote, You are not just the drop in the ocean, you are the entire ocean in each drop. Modern physics echoes this mystical insight. The boundaries between observer and observed, between self and universe, may be far more porous than our everyday experience suggests. Quantum field theory describes reality as an interconnected web of energy fluctuations with no fixed boundaries. The atoms in your body were forged in the hearts of dying stars billions of years ago. The carbon in your cells, the oxygen you breathe, the water in your blood, all of it has been cycling through countless forms of life for eons. Where exactly do you end and the universe begin? The philosopher Thomas Nagel asked one of the most profound questions in consciousness studies. What is it like to be a bat? Think about it. A bat experiences the world through echolocation, sending out high-pitched sounds and navigating by the echoes that bounce back. It sees with sound in ways we can barely imagine. But here's the thing. No matter how much we study bat brains, measure their neural activity, or map their behavior, we can never truly know what that experience feels like from the inside. There's something it's like to be you right now. The redness of red, the pain of a headache, the feeling of remembering your childhood bedroom. These inner experiences are real and vivid, yet they seem to exist in a realm that science can't quite reach. You can describe the color red to someone, but you can never transfer the actual experience of redness from your mind to theirs. But here's the paradox. When you turn your attention inward to examine this subjective experience directly, you find, what exactly? Thoughts arise and pass away. Emotions come and go. Sensations appear and dissolve. Even the sense of being the one who observes these phenomena seems to flicker in and out of existence. The closer you look for the observer, the more elusive it becomes. Dr. Benjamin Leibitz's famous experiments showed that brain activity associated with movement begins several hundred milliseconds before people report being aware of intending to move. The sense of willing an action appears to be a post hoc narrative your brain constructs after the action has already been initiated at the neural level. This suggests something deeply unsettling about free will. You may not be the author of your actions so much as the narrator who creates a story of agency after the fact. The implications cascade outward like ripples in a pond. If your decisions arise from unconscious neural processes, if your memories are constantly being reconstructed, if your sense of being a continuous self is a neurological illusion, then what does it mean to take credit or blame for anything? The ancient Greek concept of fate and the Hindu doctrine of karma both suggest that individual agency may be far more limited than we assume. Modern deterministic interpretations of neuroscience arrive at a similar conclusion through different reasoning. You may be more like a character in a story being written by processes you're not aware of. But here's where the story takes another turn. Even if free will is an illusion, even if the self is a construction, even if consciousness is a kind of controlled hallucination, something is still aware of all of this. Something is reading these words, contemplating these ideas, questioning these assumptions. You have spent your entire life looking out through your eyes at a world that seems external and separate. You have never seen your own face except as a reflection. You have never heard your own voice except as it bounces back from the world around you. You have never directly observed your own thoughts. You can only be aware of their contents. Never catch the thinker in the act of thinking. Right now, as you process these words, there's an awareness present that notices the thoughts arising in response to these ideas. That awareness is not itself a thought. It's the space in which thoughts appear. It's not an emotion. 
It's what remains present through the constant flux of emotional states. It's not a memory. It's what's aware of memories as they arise and pass away. This awareness has been present through every moment of your life. It was there in childhood, unchanged by decades of physical and psychological transformation. It's present in dreams, in deep sleep, in states of intense focus, and in moments of complete confusion. It's the one constant in the midst of constant change. The ancient Vedantic tradition calls it Sakshin, the witness consciousness that observes but is never itself observed. Zen Buddhism points to it as original mind, awareness prior to the formation of any particular self-concept. Modern contemplatives like Douglas Harding developed experiments designed to help people directly recognize this fundamental dimension of consciousness. But recognizing this awareness raises the most unsettling question of all. If this witnessing consciousness is your deepest identity, and if this same awareness is present in all conscious beings, then where exactly are the boundaries between separate selves? The 13th century Sufi mystic Ibn Arabi wrote, Wherever you turn, there is the face of God. Contemporary physics suggests that consciousness may be a fundamental property of the universe itself, not something that emerges from complex arrangements of matter, but something that matter emerges within. If consciousness is the ground of being rather than its product, then the question, what am I, transforms into something far more mysterious. What is looking through these eyes? What is aware of being aware? You will leave this exploration and return to your ordinary life with its deadlines, relationships, and familiar routines. The illusion of being a separate self will reassert itself within moments. The conviction that you're making choices, forming memories, and moving through time as a continuous identity will feel as solid as ever. But something has changed. A question has been planted in the depths of awareness, not the kind of question that demands an answer, but the kind that transforms everything simply by being asked. Tonight, when you look in the mirror, you might notice something different. Tomorrow, when thoughts arise in your mind, you might wonder who's listening. In quiet moments, you might catch glimpses of the awareness that's always been present, hiding in plain sight behind the stories you tell yourself about yourself. The watchers in the mirror are not separate from what they observe. The observer and the observed collapse into a single, undivided awareness that has no center and no boundaries. <laughs>